Welcome to the PC Perspective interview series. I'm uh, starting a new set of video interviews with multiple people from around the industry. And tonight we have a very special guest, Dave Graham from Dell Technologies. If you want to introduce yourself a little bit, tell us your title and, and what all you do. Hey, Josh. Dave Graham here. Um, as you said, I'd just like to restate my name for prominence. Um, I'm part of the Dell Technologies global messaging team. So I cover emerging technologies so that you know, it's things like artificial intelligence, 5G, edge, IoT, you name it. It kind of falls in my bucket. So quantum, I like to throw quantum and blockchain in there as well. So I cover a wide gamut of things and get to talk about some pretty cool technology. I see. What is what is kind of your current passion right now? I mean, you know, everybody at Arm right now is talking about 5G. I mean, every and Edge and IoT and, and how, you know, we're going to have this global coverage of high speed Internet that can be so incredibly bursty that, you know, it doesn't have to have, you know, large power on and, and, and you can you can support tens of thousands of of individual parts that way or, or what you know i know i kind of went on to a little talking spree but but what what is kind of your most exciting thing right now i think the most exciting stuff is really around edge um so or what gets called the edge right it's really kind of that you know not cloud not data center but anything else right so it fits into a lot of different buckets you know so the stuff that you see from like tesla right the cars the computer uh, all the data is generated out there and then that also starts to combine with interesting things like mobile phones and other kind of devices, internet of things, um, sensors, that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I get to dabble in a lot of them. So I see a lot of the, the ways that customers are changing kind of the way that they start to look at data and they start to look at the things that we do, you know, not creepy like Facebook <laughs> or Cambridge Analytica, but you know, how do we make better sense of the world that's around us through sensors, through data feeds and, and whatnot? So it's really kind of a fusion of all that. So like you said, Qualcomm, you know, 5G is poised to make a lot of these things more of a reality than they ever have been before, right? So that's exciting. But then you still have to take everything and kind of connect it together. And so that connection, you know, whether you use AI to kind of parse through everything and come up with a, a really a, a cool output or you start to immerse yourself in those worlds with like AR, VR, those kind of technologies, or you just hold on to that data and figure out something that can be useful with it down the road. So lots of stuff. <laughs> you know, speaking of, of data, you know, uh, Dell has, has been very, very uh, agile, I guess you could say in, in acquiring other storage solutions. Uh, what, how are we going to store all of this data? I mean, what, you know, maybe this will key into to some of the stuff Dell's doing. I know you've, uh, uh, didn't you, aren't you like doing have an Isilon based unit as well as the the compellent stuff that you uh, you have previously? Yeah, there is a lot of a lot of gear that we have, especially in the storage space. So um, I used to work for EMC back in 2007 to 2010. Worked on a project uh, it was called Atmos at the time, which was kind of web object scale, you know, just massive amounts of storage. It's now um, Dell EMC ECS, right? Um, Isilon was acquired just as I left. <laughs> you know, was, and here was this great, uh, you know, kind of node-based topology that was going to, you know, save the world plus dog, right? Um, you have PowerMax at the top end, you know, VNX in the middle and, and all these kind of storage devices. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that we're seeing, you know, and, and storage has had its resurgence a, a little bit, right? It's no longer, you know, the fiber channel guys go off in their corner and don't talk to anybody and NAS, you know, rules on this other side. It's, it's kind of that symbiotic relationship now that you see kind of with um, NVMe over fabrics, right? So now I can use a lot of the, the structures and infrastructure that I had you know, together, you know, and combine that kind of IP and block-based, you know, block-based storage. So a lot of emphasis around MVME over fabrics. Um, as far as like what we're storing it on, um, there's, you're seeing the development of, you know, of high capacity solid state storage. I mean, that's really kind of the, the future, I think, of everything. It's great to see stuff like, you know, 20 terabyte spinning disks coming out, you know, using Hammer or, you know, Western Digital's variation on a theme, you know, using magnetic resonance and whatever. Like, those are really, really cool. And there's always going to be a place, I think, for that level of density, that level of rotational speed or, or level of access, I should say. Um, tape is still around, funny enough, you know, tape 
still <laughs> still handles the long term cold storage better than anything. Um, so a lot of it just comes becomes very interesting. You know, it's how you classify your data, how you tier it. I mean, you start to look at storage class memories, or uh, I'm pretty sure Rob Pegler would kill me for saying storage class memories, but you know, persistent memory technologies like Optane. Um, and Micron's uh, variation on that, you know, starting to be that kind of tier one and a half, right? Like right that next level of access that's still connected at high speed and low latency, but it's not where you're going to spend most of your capacity at, right? And, then, you know, just a lot of a lot of different technologies around that. So I continue to see that one moving forward. That's pretty fascinating stuff because, yeah, I mean, at my other place of, of work, uh, my primary work, we just went to an LT5, LT7 tape set up for uh it's actually a, a dell unit oddly enough and and i'm getting no kickbacks whatsoever for interviewing <laughs> we appreciate this. you as a customer but, no worries. but yeah yeah no it's uh so yeah it, 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 it is amazing to me that tape still has a place in the universe because it just it's so dense and you guys have expanded i mean you have these six terabytes to 12 terabyte tapes with you know uh, compression and you know it's slow but it's still many gigs a minute and uh yeah you just put them on a shelf and if you really need them and they're inexpensive and they don't really degrade at until you know many years down the down the road so that's that's kind of interesting to to think um you know, I remember seeing my first uh, you know those those u-shaped drives that have the robotic arms that go and yeah, I mean, I saw that was. I mean, I finally saw one of those like 15 years ago, and about blew my mind. It's like, yeah, we've got uh, 35 terabytes of uh, tape storage here that we do, <laughs> and it's like, wow, that was a lot of storage back in the day. Good old Not quantum so tape now. libraries, yeah, 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 well, yeah they're yeah. incredible. You know, <laughs> Dell has been very, very famous for many years as being an Intel only shop. And what? back in 2004, 2005, that that kind of just got thrown by the wayside because of, you know, pressures around the industry. And plus, you know, AMD had some interesting products. And after Opteron, AMD really slowed down with the bulldozer. And, and even though those were interesting chips in terms of, you know, how much the thread density you could have in these machines, the performance just wasn't there. And Intel had distinct advantages in their Xeon class products. But now we're moving away. The original uh, Epic um, was competitive in many ways, but it had drawbacks. But now the new Rome-based Epic is seemingly knocking down a lot of doors, and you have several products based on this. Could you tell us a little bit about them and, and what maybe led you guys to the place where you're adopting this technology when for many years you know, AMD was simply not competitive? Yeah, uh- Absolutely. So we have everything from single socket, you know, AMD based or AMD Rome based or AMD Epic based. Let's use the proper name, I suppose. AMD Epic uh, servers from single socket to dual socket to um, kind of a hyper converged box, if you will, 6525, which is a, um, a very dense, you know, it's four nodes, two RU, two sockets per, per node, right? So get really good uh, compute density there. Um, I would say that, you know, the big change, as you identified, I mean, Opteron back in this, I say the three digit days was, was amazing. Right. You know, I used to sell Opterons <laughs> from my apartment. I have a picture of my kid, like nestled in the boxes of Opteron 150s. Right. Uh, they were, they were hot stuff, right. Everybody wanted them. They, you know, from a instructions for clock or, you know, a, a, a transactions per second kind of standpoint, they were, they were incredible. It was a really well built platform. You know, they took a gamble uh, with Bulldozer and the Excavator series, and you know, and and that the way that they did ran threads, like you're saying. Um, and uh, I, that, it was a risk that didn't pay off. I mean, I think if you talk to anybody in the executive staff at AMD, they'll say, "Hey, listen, you know, we we did it. It worked for some stuff. It didn't work for everything. It wasn't ubiquitous. And and at that time, Intel was executing to plan. You know, there wasn't you know, there wasn't a lot of variability in what you would see there. So, you know, I kind of call it the inverse parabola, right? So you have AMD just kind of dipping down and then climbing back out with, with Naples, right? You know, so first generation of Epic and, you know, kind of the Zen architecture, right? Um, part of what we saw was an increased customer demand. You know, 
<laughs> welcome to enterprise business. If customers demand it, we owe it to our investors and we invoke in owe it to our customers to look at the technologies that are there. So it's always been something where we're going to go out there. We're going to look and see what the market is actually demanding. You know, and what we saw was people were coming to us going, wow, AMD is actually offering something now that has more cores, uh, more memory support. You know, it seems to be an iterative platform that promises longevity and even the jump from gen you know, PCI Gen 3 to Gen 4, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point here. You know, they're, they're, they have, a, they have a, an aggressive roadmap. And better yet, they seem to be sticking to it, which is, as we know in recent news, I mean, Intel's had some challenges around executing to roadmap, you know, delays in 10 nanometer delivery for, especially in the Xeon space, you know, it's, you know, it's, that's their bread and butter. The DCB unit is, is pretty huge. So, you know, a lot of that stuff kind of came to the fore. And so when customers started demanding AMD boxes based on density, based on memory support, based on kind of advanced IO pro, you know, advanced IO capabilities through gen four, um, we put our ear to the rail and said, listen, AMD, if you can execute, we'll get out there and we'll, we'll work with you. And they did, you know, it's everything behind the scenes is obviously a scatter gather type operation. You know, we got to get parts, we got to validate platforms, we got to do some stuff. And so it's not, you know, it's, it's it tends to be pretty difficult to, you know, throw everything at a single vendor. I mean, good rule of business, you never single source anything, right? You want to have multiple supply chains and we are massive. We're one of the world's largest logistics companies, right? Um, when it comes down to parts and, you know, assembly and everything. So maintaining that good supply chain, maintaining all that stuff becomes very, very important. Customer and, I mean, just ticks all the boxes. So the execution has really kind of led to AMD's, you know, uh, demand pipeline you know, with us, which in turn has led to increased sales. Um, I was at Supercompute 2019 uh, a couple, uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, something like that. And people couldn't stop asking about AMD, uh, whether it be in single socket, which is, you know, more of an IO story, like, hey, 128 lanes of PCI Gen 3, like I can do so much with this box to <laughs> dual socket to, yeah, you name it, right? There's, there's just a lot of capability built into these things, right? And again, if AMD hadn't executed and if AMD continues to follow their execution plan, I can only project really good things. You know, I don't have the crystal ball that, you know, some you know, folks way above my station do. But from that kind of middle layer, you know, everything they've done so far has been, you know, it's been <laughs> helping their case and helping us turn around and sell those boxes. So what is the interconnection between, you know, we're talking about these 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 multiple node machines. I mean, what what is the backplane interconnect that you use? Is it is it PCIe based or is it a different uh Yeah, so there's there's a lot of different variations here. Um I think in some of most of the topologies where where you know Ethernet <laughs> I used to say this from my time at Juniper, Ethernet always wins. It's just how long it takes you to recognize that it does. <laughs> so um, the beauty of having a large amount of IO or large amount of IO handling within a given platform is that you can actually, you know, can layer technologies together. So again, if we start to look at stuff like um, TAC, you know, Texas Accelerated Compute Center and, and Stampede, which is a supercomputer built around, you know, our nodes. Um, you know, we're looking at stuff that's in, I believe it's InfiniBand connected, right? Still Ethernet for modern, you know, day-to-day -day operation and, you know, node management or whatever. Um, there's no mid-plane, you know, active mid-plane that provides active mid-plane mid management in this stuff. It's not a blade server. I mean, so we get around that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of what we're seeing is the, you know, some of the newer stuff that's coming out here, like HPC IP, right? So it's a stripped down kind of version of IP, if you will. It contains only the necessary headers or requirements around that. So if folks like Cray are, are using that for Slingshot, right? It's pretty fantastic. It's Ethernet, though. You know, 200 gig Ethernet. So don't, you know, it doesn't require a massive rework to your cable plan or any of that. Um, but like with that's, these large newer platforms, well, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I said that, that's, that's pretty fast. And just because it's a technology that's been around for 30 plus years and it just keeps getting, I mean, you know, <laughs> we got 10G at the desktop at the really, really high end. But yeah, it seems in these applications that you're, you don't care about the TDP of, of whatever Ethernet chip you're running uh, because it's it's a supercomputer. And so you can, yeah, you can you can jack that stuff up. 
Well, we're seeing that even in in enterprise servers now. There's the big push. Like, you know, depends on how you stack rank stuff or how you start to look at it. Um, Broadcom's done a very good job of like starting to push the hundred gig agenda. Right, I mean, everybody needs hundred gig ports because it gives you a densification story that's pretty cool. I can run a 10 gig switch now, four by 25, two by 50, or 10 by 10, depending on the division, right? So now I can get better efficacy to those those servers if I need to. But we're seeing a lot of requests for 25 gig. You know, that's starting to show up a lot more, especially in enterprise. Um, 10 gig, like you said, to the desktop is starting to become more ubiquitous. There, obviously, Quantia and, and companies like that are pushing that onto the desktop and motherboard manufacturers, likewise. So I think that just continues to trickle its way up. 400 gig is on the horizon right now in massive, den- you know, in more density configurations, right? So a lot of the Tomahawk 3 stuff from, from Broadcom, uh, Jericho 2, so on and so forth is really kind of pushing 400 gig now as, as the de facto interconnect standard. And then that goes to 200 or 100, and then that kind of pushes its way down. That net, we're in a, the era of bandwidth, if I, if I could call it that, and having plenty of it. And how much reading do you do a night on all of these products to be able to just ramble off this crap? <laughs> I think I told somebody one time that I read between six to eight hours a day um, of material. I mean, listen, we are blessed, I think, in this wonderful information age. Obviously, you and I interchange all the time on Twitter with Dr. Cutrus, and I get to call him Dr. Cutrus. I love that. Uh, with Ian and <laughs> Charlie and all the all, all the folks in our little tight-knit community there. Yep. But a lot of it is, you know, as we kind of push into these different communities of, of, of thought and leadership, right? Uh, sitting around at Supercompute, you can walk booths and talk to anybody. And these are practitioners, not necessarily marketing folks, you know, people that have gone in there. I mean, I did my time at Juniper. I worked, you know, worked in the data, in data center stuff. And so a lot of this stuff. You just pick it up as you go along, but it's been a blessing all along to kind of be able to chat with people that have these special areas of, of knowledge and listen in and learn, you know, it's always be learning. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So with, you know, going back to Epic, uh, it seems like for the server space, you know, kind of the, 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 I mean, it's, it's incredibly dense. Yep. It's very power efficient because of, you know, seven nanometer construction plus how they've, you know, swapped around this big IO chip and all the chiplets and, and they can really do a lot of things with playing around the TDP, but it seems to me the biggest factor in, 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 well, Maybe not the biggest factor. I mean, threads are still king. But one of the biggest advantages that AMD has is is PCIe Gen 4. Because while there may not be a lot of other components that will utilize it, storage is seemingly the thing we can't get enough of and bandwidth. And, you know, people doing these massive databases. And we've got social networks that, that require just so much high-speed RAM and also amazingly high-speed storage. So... Is that primarily what you're seeing these go to, or is it a mix and match of of what these needs are? And plus, can you talk a little bit about uh, the actual storage solutions that that utilize PCA Gen four? I think Samsung has a uh, you know half height, half length Gen four based unit that you know does you know eight lanes and 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 sixteen right. gigabytes a second and. <laughs> so yeah. like 1.6 million IOPS. Yeah, massive, right? Yeah, so let's go back to the platform for a second. So PCI, PCI has always been, um, I mean, it's a ubiquitous standard, right? Everybody has, conforms to it. Um, up until Gen 4 and really kind of, you know, the encoding scheme is that we're, you know, we're brought by that like 128, you know, what, 66 over 68B or whatever. I forget what the uh, actual scheme is. You notice that PCI Gen 3 kind of languished in market for years, right? It was there. Yeah, like a decade. Plus, five, five, yeah, yeah. If I was going to say five plus, but let's go with a decade. That's a great, <laughs> you know, keep on forgetting what decade we're actually in. Or yay, 2020. Um, yeah. Then all of a sudden you have this kind of critical mass that shows up, right? So we have Gen 4, then Gen 5 gets ratified you, but within about a year, year and a half, right? And then we have Gen 6 that's on the horizon. Now, we've also coupled some other things, which I can talk about later, like CXL, C6, Gen Z. We've kind of had some momentum floating outside of that as a way to interconnect a lot of these things, bring some of the fundamentals of what I can plug into the box and do something uh, that you would archetypically be called composable infrastructures, right? I have my little box full of storage that's interconnected using CXL or Gen Z or C6 to my, my standard box. All that aside, PCI Express has been around. 
it's ubiquitous is something that people want to do. So when Gen 4 came along, it, it was an interesting marketing differentiator. It wasn't necessarily a differentiator in hardware. And here's the reason why. Nobody was making anything that had Gen 4 capabilities. So at any given point, you're still basically down clocking the bus to Gen 3, running at the bandwidth, you know, bandwidth specifications there. However, a couple things kind of happened along along the way. Um, dev kits for Gen 4 got out early. Uh, dev kits for Gen 5 have gotten out early, so people are able to develop against that. Um, Rambus, believe it or not, has some Gen 4 and Gen 5 FIs that are, are available that people can go out and purchase, amongst others, right? So a large effort was made to make sure that people were developing to spec and standards, and then would be able to integrate the platforms. I remember I was talking about network bandwidth. Well, network was also driving, you know, interconnects or communications was also driving the need for bigger bandwidth. Not necessarily storage, because remember, I can do funky stuff with storage in the back end to make things perform the way I need to. Instead of going serially, I can parallelize stuff. I can make, you know, uh, data Data Direct Networks, for example, it has a wide front end, so I can address large amounts of storage. It's like having a Big ass sewer pipe, if I can say it that way, right? Tons of shit, <laughs> just going straight down. Um, so you're able to get around it by being creative in how infrastructure is created, um, or how storage is created, and how you you know kind of carve that front end out. Um, for a lot of things, that transactional nature didn't require large amounts of bandwidth at you know continually supercompute notwithstanding, right? There's always been specialty in high performance computing. But for the most part, you were able to kind of churn along and do transactions based on the speed of the bus. AMD kind of flipped the switch on Gen 4 and said, hey, listen, we're going to give you, you know, more slots, you know, and then more lanes, you know, up to 162, I believe, in Rome, depending on the configuration, which is a lot, right? So when you start to look at by 16 lanes, that's, I don't even, I can't even do the math, but let's just say it's a, it's more than eight. It's like 10 lanes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I, mean, I could have done that math. God, I'm so it's okay. bored tonight. Oh. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> That's still a lot. So if I start to look at um, a, a single 100 gig port, which would typically oversubscribe a by 16 slot in a, you know, a standard Intel server, if I may make the comparison, that now can fit comfortably on non oversubscribed in a by 16 or even a by 8, you know, by 16 slot in a Gen 4 server. So you start to look at I'm alleviating back pressure. So I can do more and interesting things. So you're, to your point about Samsung's um, adding card, this starts to add in more flexibility. Now I can do 7.8, I think it was something like 7.8 gigs a second down to the cart, whereas before I was capped at half that amount, right? So now you start to look at what what more can I do, you know, um, and all those kind of capabilities. So I think that's been a big driver. We're still in a place where hardware has to catch up a little bit to the bus, which is why, you know, and I'll, I'll give credit where credit's due on this one. It's nice that AMD put Gen 4 on the platform. I think it, starts to drag companies along to support it, which is very, very good. FPGA manufacturers, GPU manufacturers, storage, and networking, right? The four principles, four horsemen of the apocalypse, really. Um, conversely, I don't think Intel's necessarily missing out on too much, and that would may shock some folks. But because Intel's kind of stated plan of record is really to kind of look at PCI Gen 5, they're not going to experience the same gap in market, I believe that you know while we're while while they're waiting, right? So all Gen four devices will conform, you know, will be able to work on Gen five and they'll be able to work at the speeds that they were given. So it's kind of if I wait long enough and as I develop and make sure my platform is mature, which is something that Intel's historically been pretty good at, when I deliver that platform, then, everything that's been developed in market that may be bleeding edge and had teething problems now suddenly becomes workable. So it's, it's kind of that push me, pull you type type process. Right. So I think that's been good that AMD's is kind of taking the charge. You're going to see a lot of that on the consumer side, you know, video cards, I think, are, you know, graphics cards, video cards. Uh, graphics cards will be a, a perfect case point for that. Um, we're seeing, I think it was MSI or gigabyte had the four by uh, you know, the by 16, by four uh, NVMe, you know, add-in card. That's awesome. I mean, imagine putting a couple 97, 970s, you know, Samsung 970s in there and having some blistering speed being delivered across a, you know, gaming platform or a content 
you know, content creation platform or any of these things. It just makes everything better within that market, right? And Threadripper is obviously, you know, huge for the digital content creation side. So I think we're all making out like bandits when it comes down to it. It's just how long it takes some of these things to show up and show up in market. Does that yeah. kind of answer your question for that one? <laughs> it does. You know, moving along, so basically Intel is just going to skip Gen 4 altogether. I mean, I, I know that uh, AMD was hit there first and, you know, it's just a, an evolution of, of Gen 3 in, in many ways, but it seems like there's there's more things added to Gen 5 than, you know, what what is... You know, I wish I'd read up a little bit more about this, but, but essentially Intel is skipping Gen 4, correct? Or, or, or do they have plans or have they announced anything, I should rather say, rather than try to get a backdoor from, uh, from their partner. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're going to have gen four, uh, gen four support in, in an upcoming platform. I think we're at Cooper right now. So ice Lake would be one that would come out. I, I, I don't know roadmaps off the top of my head, so I can't really speculate on that, but I believe the stated path or direction, depending on when platform readiness is, is available. They'll either be gen four or be gen five. Intel has to support, you know, typically they will support whatever the current standard is. So I'm not worried about that. It will show up when it shows up in, in, in terms of their readiness. But, um, you know, Gen 5, PCI Gen 5 for Intel is a is a big stepping stone with the delivery of CXL plus um, PCI Gen 5 concurrently in platform. I think it might be Sapphire Rapids, which everybody talks about, but somewhere around that time frame. So Xeon yeah. SP next, if if you will. So Okay. Hey, uh, what, um, you know, around the world, we, we've, I mean, primarily a lot of, uh, you know, servers all been sold in North America and some Europe and, mm-hmm. uh, but, but where do you see the most growth? I mean, obviously probably Asia and China, but what are some of the, 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 the other areas of, of interest and growth that you've seen while working here at Dell? Um, I just paid a lot of attention to um, the EMEA market. So Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um there seems to be a resurgence in a lot of companies taking on uh, new workloads. Again, I think going back to my comment about the edge, all this data being generated is, you know, in this age of mobility and, and, you know, cell phones and tablets and laptops and everything, you know, it's generating all this data. Um, I think there's been a, a resurgence in how do we handle all this influx? You know, certainly you have the, the major cloud providers, Amazon, Azure, Google, um, so on and so forth, Oracle, lest we forget, um, you know, out there and obviously our efforts through VMware to kind of support those platforms. But generally speaking, all this influx of data is taking its toll on compute infrastructure. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of these, you know, like this demand generation, right, um, for for service. So I had a couple of conversations over over the, the fall when I was in, in Europe doing some forum form work out there and people are excited there it's you know there's kind of a you know a new game in town right so it's maybe less about the hardware than it is about the newer things that they can do or the applications now that benefit from this increased compute capacity right so um we're always going to be selling boxes that's 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 perfect and that's great but you know it's how we start to layer the technologies on top of that what are we doing with it so the use cases are are things that are more exciting like autonomous driving massive amounts of compute analytics uh, artificial intelligence tied into that and as well as communications you know that starts to push a large amount of data down a pipe that needs to be it needs to be kind of dissected analyzed understood and then you turned into something useful so that's a huge one um agriculture is actually massively expanding into the internet of things space so how do we start to sample our our crop yields how do we do you know how do we have more intelligence about when to harvest when to sow right and so we're able to start doing data correlation there that requires compute and more capacity there so it's um it's been kind of fantastic to see this because all these use cases now start to pull in these various threads of technology and start to weave them together into something that's um, a lot more interesting. You know, technology for technology's sake is kind of boring, right? I love it. I love talking about hardware. I like doing that. But when you start to see everything kind of synthesized together and what the outputs end up being, that becomes extremely exciting. Yeah, we were able to do this because, you know, computes you know, computes available now in, in scale that it never was. Communications are at scale that they never were in storage is at scale that it never was before. And so you start to combine these things together. And by the way, software's pretty awesome as well. And so this now starts to tie all this stuff together and here's my application. And 
I just created this this beautiful data monster <laughs> that's able to accomplish yeah. stuff. So that's that's the exciting part. Yeah, I know for you know the other company, I, I always keep talking about them that I that I work for that we started a program with with drones that uh, it's an environmental statistics firm and we take these drones and we fly them around, uh, you know, like wind farms or in areas where these animals are uh, possibly threatened. And we're trying to get it to work so that, you know, just the, the payload on a small drone with a decent camera can do, take a picture of the, you know, X amount of meters squared and be able to analyze in less than a second. You know, if, if they see these birds, for example, in this picture and it can do, you know, real time counts. It can do things like, you know, let's stop and investigate more, but we weren't able to do any of these things before we had, you know, kind of more machine learning and really powerful hardware that does not require a whole lot of power. And you can mount it on the back of a 10 pound drone and yeah. fly it up and down the coast for, you know, uh, doing, doing crossovers and uh, you get all this data and yeah, you just have this little, nano or jetson x2 or whatever we're planning on using to do that and it'll it'll do it in real time and that's a lot of software tuning as well as just yeah. we have that hardware available that can do a lot of work and that's where i so actually think you know to that to that point that's that's one of the areas that's probably the most exciting if i delve into hardware specifically um i was in a conversation the other day we were talking about cerebras right so the this big you know 15 kilowatt you know single unified piece of silicon uh there's pictures of that out there you know wafer scale mm -hmm. uh and that's always exciting yeah big iron's always exciting and you know gpus are always exciting but that sub 75 watt space like you're saying that kind of low power low utilization space becomes the most intriguing part about it because when you start to think about you know, here's an iPhone, right? And it has a, an MPU in here that does neural processing, you know, and Apple's, you know, marketing bullshit aside. The interesting part about that is I can start to run routines here that I never could do before. And I'm running in a, you know, sub five watt package, or you start to look at what Qualcomm's doing with 865 and Snapdragon 865, or it's kind of the emergence of ARM, you know, which is or risk or, you know, sci five, right? So really kind of pushing into the sub 75 watt space or even sub 50 watt space, but being able to do this inferencing and doing this kind of calculation work. Like you're saying, lots of software tuning has to go into it. You gotta, you gotta train then that, you know, training has to be then applied to, to your modeling and, and all that stuff. Or it's actually the opposite way. You have a model and then you have training as a model, but whatever. Um, you know, a lot of that, that space be, allows you to do that stuff. Like, nature you know conserve conservation work and, and everything like that so that's that's absolutely fascinating to me that's that's the one area where i think there's there's a lot of potential and a lot of growth not just from a monetary standpoint because you know whatever we can sell stuff but um from the kind of that social transformation or that that capability of doing really cool shit out there with regardless of what what's going on like it's, it's that's that's just awesome to me so yeah. Congratulations. You got a great company going on there. <laughs> We're working on it. But, uh, you know, the, this moves us along to uh, to what's ARMS doing. I mean, uh, they're, you, they're again, they're, they're in pretty much every damn cell phone in the world. I mean, all the Intel and Microsoft ones are, are dying out and not to be seen again. So everything is, is, is ARM based there, but now they're starting to get into, you know, the edge stuff. Uh, they're, they're trying to get their partners to design networking chips and, uh, chips that will go into these 5g transceivers and things that they want to do with ai to help make uh the, these 5g stations more efficient in what they do because they can kind of figure out what traffic is is needed and when and and you know how to balance all that and and they have these you know uh pretty pretty complex models on and that they're trying to do in these these five and, and ten watt spaces for these these parts but they're also looking into servers i would think it's what marvell has uh the the arm servers that um they support pcie 4.0 they use the c6 as well for for uh, uh cache coherency with these huge multiprocessor systems i mean what is dell's thinking and, and you're thinking about that as well uh is is this good for the industry um is it adding more noise and complexity or is it something you feel the Dell could capitalize on and, and offer a product that will, that will fit multiple niches with arm hardware? Yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. So first off, so 
Dell Capital is one of our investment arms, right? So we've gone out there and we we invest in companies like Graphcore. Uh, and recently we we made an investment in Nuvia, right? So John Masters and and a whole bunch of folks out, out in the valley have um, kind of combined to create another chip startup, right? And maybe on the RMISA, who knows? Um, the good news is that there is development in the CPU race, if you will. I mean, Via Centaur announced, you know, their uh, x86 compatible CPU that has an you know, an AP in our processing unit, and, you know, for AI acceleration in it. Um, I think the beauty of ARM has always been you can buy an infrastructure license and an architecture license from us, and then you can go take that and abstract upon it, right? I can do all kinds of things. AMD, for example, is an ARM infrastructure licensee and they had a product called seattle they actually had an optron 1100 which was out um seattle was the optron a 1100 yeah um and it was an arm processor for amd kind of crazy it was just i think it was pretty much bog standard but you know that was it was an interesting foray by an x86 giant if you will into that space so we're seeing this also with the resurgence of risk five right so the sci-5 coalition sci-5 coalition and everything that they're doing there so the cool part is that there's there people are not as scared of you know different instruction set assemblies anymore different architectures or um capabilities anymore i think it's part of that is education you know a lot of what's going on in universities today is teaching you know fun you know teaching some very good root fundamentals on how to develop how to write for or you know not just limited to um x86 this is all you got. I think the second part of that is also the ubiquity thing. You know, as we're raising a, a generation of application developers, right, that are writing for for ARM, even though they're writing to IO, you know, writing using Xcode, but they're really writing to ARM when it comes down to what's running in, on Apple computers. So they're writing to Android, which is, again, running on ARM, a lot of that stuff. It's become kind of a, you know, it's starting to, become more common, more ubiquitous to them, right? So I think the software tools are improving pretty dramatically that you can you can more easily cross port things over as compared to ten or fifteen years ago where you yeah, had to worry you using know, high end for like power and x eighty six and yeah and nobody wanted to go in between those two things except exactly Apple. And I think yeah <laughs> And I think, yeah, so not everybody has to use ICC anymore, you know, if they want to get x86 performance, right? You can use Clang, LLVM, whatever. Um, yeah, so we're raising a, 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 a more flexible generation, if you will, uh, through education and opportunities there. So couple that to specific type of workloads. Again, as we've kind of scaled up or as these hyperscalers come to market, they, they you know suddenly realize that, hey, wait a second, <laughs> not everything needs to be served by, you know, these heavy hitting or, you know, power consumptive devices like, you know, AMD or Intel chips, right? There is a space for low power, lower instructions per clock, lower, lower transactional capability in general, but I can do it with many cores, right? So you're running N Nginx instances or, you know, like Cloudflare was one of the folks that started talking about the Cavium, um, well, Cavium announced Marvell uh, processors, right? So, you know, they found a workload that could, that could, you know, speculatively use that. And, you know, given the kind of flexibility in the in the ARM architecture, you can plug in these modules, a crypto cryptography module into the overall chip manufacturing process, right? And you get get good things out of it. ARM is a fantastic company from an IP standpoint, right? And the fact that they're fabulous also means that they enable partners to develop these. You know, like you, now you can license it from, you know, from ARM and then turn around to TSMC and go to town, right? Now you, you suddenly have capabilities there. So I think that's done, you know, it's made made the market more receptive and more, you know, uh, amenable to a, a tertiary architecture, if you will, um, or secondary architecture. Um, you know, with uh, with RISC-V, you know, you're getting something that's starting out small. It's starting out in embedded devices. It's starting to moving its way up. Um, you know, so Western Digital is providing kind of some of the, con you know, controller logic into hard drives, right? Um, other kind of embedded devices that can use that. So as that generational capability continues to increase, you're going to start to see that. And we 
you know, I don't know what the end result of Nuvia will be, but knowing that they're bringing in a lot of ARM, you know, ARM folks probably will be based around ARM, I say. If it's not, that's great. But that continues to push things forward. And so people, are, like I said, people are less scared of doing things now um, off platform, you know, and what we want to get to is a place where I don't care <laughs> what platform it's going to be on. I don't. I'm going to write my application. I'm going to write my resulting, um, you know, the resultant thing. I'm going to write it one time or code it, develop it, however, one time, and then I'm going to deploy it many times. And it shouldn't matter what platform it goes on. And the tool sets are there now. I, they're becoming more and more uh, robust, but they're they're starting to get out there. And that's, that's you know, we've seen that in my lifetime. So that's that's pretty amazing. This is the one thing about Risk Five that I found really, really fascinating, and and I know there's a certain personality on, on Twitter that uh, that you know is is very uh, critical about uh, many things, not Intel. But uh, one of the complaints was that uh, you know you will allow customization of your core, and suddenly nothing is going to work together anymore. But with Risk Five and and your example, Western Digital is it's a very focused solution. This is not. You're not going to go out and run an OS on a risk five processor on, on the, that's running the, the the storage controller on on your hard drive. I mean, it's just it's a product that they're focused on that it does a certain job, and they want to add some capabilities to it. Well, that's fine. You can go ahead and do that, but it's it's not it's not going to be running Windows. It's 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 not going to have exploits that you or I can know. I mean, it's just. Uh, yeah, I, I I like the functionality and the idea of of Risk Five just because you're given a tool set to make something that very very specific to you. And again, it's not for general consumption. It's, it's I mean, eventually you may get to some Risk Five products that that will do that, and they have to be hardened and they have to be tested and whatnot. But yeah, the 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 idea and the flexibility there instead of getting some licensing some you know, low power arm core and, and putting two of those on, on a drive controller as compared to you spend the time, you have the capability to design a CPU of your own and it's yours. You don't have to license it. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly all the licensing things with the press five, but it's not, it's not the same as, is arm. Correct. Oh, it's not. Yeah, no, it's, you know, arm is, is, very much a pay for architecture, right? I mean, that's their business model. Um, whereas, you know, the Risk Five Consortium and the folks that are members of it, it is. Uh, it, I was going to say it's more like an Apache license. It's obviously with a little bit of difference. I don't have it in front of me, but you know, it's designed to be open and flexible based on the needs that you have. You know, as long as you're contributing into the overall ideals, you know. And that we've seen ARM actually take a little bit out of that playbook as well, you know, especially with the Cindy, you know, the vector and the new and vectors and instructions that, um, you know, Fujitsu worked on, you know, the Cindy instructions and stuff. So I think, you know, ARM is taking bits and pieces from that playbook as well, which is great. We want openness in the market. We want to continue to push people to develop new and exciting things. Um, you know, the good news is that the genesis, you know, the kind of genesis for Risk Five had that at its core. It was something that they wanted to deliver and they, you know, made it a mission. And I think they're doing, you know, from for all intents and purposes, they're delivering on that. Um, on the flip side, I think, you know, ARM's methodology and go to market was absolutely apropos given the time to market that they had, right? It, they had to make money somehow. And that kind of begets the continued cadence. You know, every year we have, you know, in derivations or introductions of new newer type of stuff. And that that's there's a need for that as well. So I think it's a both and type type market and We'll see where they kind of cross over at some point in the future, right? You know, ARM may become more open, so Risk Five may become more closed. Who knows, right? The uh, the goal right now is just to get them into market, get people using them, and figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, fascinating times. Things are moving. You know, for a while there, everything. You know, in the '90s, I grew up in there. You know, in my early, my late teens and early twenties, and it was like you know, every six months, something new came out, and then things kind of slowed down. And it wasn't just Moore's law; it was just you know. It was a maturing industry, and you had Intel and AMD and AMD and NVIDIA, and you had ARM just slowly making these, you know, chunks, and then the iPhone, uh, original iPhone in 2007 hit, and uh, that was such a huge boost for for ARM. So it's it's neat to see that we're at a point where there are so many interesting players, and everybody is releasing these new and 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 unique architectures and and uh, features 
at a pace that you know I haven't really seen in in a long time. So it's neat to see this kind of um, aggressiveness from many players around the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. So one last thing we can we can probably talk about. You know, we don't. You know, with the gaming world, people talk about GPUs, and of course, you know, Nvidia says you know they're they're working hard on the autonomous driving, and that. But how much do you see in graphics compute? Is there still? I mean, is it is it really pushing parts of the industry? Is it a little bit overblown from what you know Nvidia and, and AMD and these others have been talking about, or is there is it just some place in between that there's there's positive growth but not explosive that's a loaded question i know <laughs> i mean uh, no i like it i like it i tend to be on uh probably the more um uh, i don't know people don't know me would probably say i'm on the more negative end when it comes to gpus and that's not to say that there's no benefit there i think you know i've watched i've certainly watched nvidia i've run a 1080 myself uh while well, having md i have 5700 xt coming in an alienware box you know hopefully this week fingers crossed mm. um i like to diversify my portfolio if you say if you, if you will um competition always begets better things for consumers right so every, for every single push that jensen does on on his side with nvidia you know lisa's there right back on the other side pushing back as well right and raja doing will get there as well <laughs> They'll get there. Um, you know, so I, I always try to maintain a healthy dose of skepticism, right? Uh, GPU, you know, especially in, when you start looking at HPC space, you know, they're called general purpose GPUs for a reason, right? They're good. They're not going to be the best at everything, right? They they run right up the middle, and they should. It's what they were designed for, you know. NVIDIA's provides some tweaks, you know, through the V100 series, right? And getting some massive amount, uh, massive amount of compute capability, tensor capability, for example, um, for data center oriented tasks. And that's been incredible. Like, I, I honestly think that they have pushed the high performance computing market for, far more forward than anything else in, you know, the last 20 years, right? Compute, you know, the, the ability to execute on that. And that's why you see most systems in high performance computing now. As a matter of fact, I think all of them are all hybrid systems. It's all CPU plus GPU, right? Or of some level. Um, AMD to the same level. I mean, there were things that AMD, you know, it's this constant leap, leapfrogging stuff, stuff that AMD did. Um, you know, we look at Mantle, we look at the DirectX 12 kind of directed API type approach, or is that DirectX 11? I forget. But, you know, that push to get, yeah, or Vulcan, I think was Vulcan, Mantle Vulcan. Yep. yep. There we go. It was getting down one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that that ability now to start to address the hardware through the operating system a lot more directly, right? Calling directly to hardware versus trying to run a, a deeper abstraction layer. Um, I think that was something that they pushed on, and obviously Microsoft took it and ran with it, and then became kind of core to that. So you kind of see this push pull all the time, right? It's just it's constantly moving forward. Uh, I don't think it ever has to be you know, leaps and bounds or exponential growth in that space. You know, I think there's a good steady state there. You know, you iterate. Um, if anything, I think GPUs get released too often. <laughs> you know, we have a problem with, let's say, the games catching up to a lot of this stuff. I mean, for as many benchmarks as we we love to look at when new products are released, I mean, come on now. Are you really going to look at something at 320 frames a second and be able to differentiate? You know, like, really? Come on, <laughs> you know, and so we've reached a level where 1080p gaming now, I think, is uh, I keep on using the word ubiquitous, but it becomes more ubiquitous, right? I'm on a 4K monitor right now. I always downscale my stuff. I don't game at 4K anymore, uh, just simply because my monitor is way too, it sounds like a humble brag, but it's too big. I, I, I don't want to look at that. I usually window it and then put it over on this side. Um, so we have the capability there, and I'm, I'm not really stressing my, my video card out at all. You know, that's just just there and so 2080 ti supers whatever all that kind of fun stuff it's great on the uh, on the compute side you know the constant innovation that we have in there you know ray tracing um i could care less i mean really for me that's awesome you're doing more advanced forms of math i mean i think this 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 starts to be you know that's awesome what are you doing on the fundamental side what are you doing in the hardware that's making that possible and i think that's really it's it's a good thing it's before it's time, it's not ready yet, you know? So I think that, you know, I think we saw that in the launch of it, like people going, really, is this all that much better? It's really not. I mean, 
sure it shades things a little bit differently and looks a little bit better on the screen, but you know, the appreciable result is not there. And, and, and feel free to, you know, countermand that because I have my, my little world and little perspective on that. So I just tend to think that that market should slow itself. I don't need 15 variations of the same card being released in, you know, bang, bang, bang. Um, I think the 1600 to 1650 to whatever jump is kind of like, really, dude, it's a clocking difference. Maybe an ROP ad or or CU ad or whatever. It doesn't matter. So some of that stuff I think is just, you know, it's just gaming, gaming the market, right? It's just trying to figure out what's going to sell and what doesn't. So I'm all for kind of retarding that growth a little bit uh, and not, you know, retarding that sales, I should say on that side. Um, have you messed it, with you know, like, like Quake Two RTX? <laughs> no, I've seen I've seen some of the screenshots. You know, like I I, was, I did a lot of first you know FPS kind of gaming. Mm-hmm. You know, probably five years five years ago. I'm I you gotta know, the, be honest. I'm, the no, the difference <laughs> between you know a a, a modern game like uh, say Red Dead Redemption, and then you look back at, at the Quake Two RTX, it is the subtleties of what ray tracing can do that that makes things really jump out it's 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 kind of fascinating i mean if you've if you get a chance get a borrow a 2060 or 2070 or whatever and and you know buy quake 2 for five bucks and then try it out and just play around i mean it's still very much a 1997 game i mean the models (laughs) they've, they've improved them on some but when sure. you start looking at the the water effects and the lining effects and the things that, I mean, it just, it's it's really hard to explain. And you can't really see a whole lot of it when you watch a video. It just, you lose something in, in there. But once you experience it yourself, you know, I'm not trying to be a paid spokesperson <laughs> for NVIDIA and RTX, but um, yeah, it's one of those things that you, you've got to see it to to really understand what they're doing and interact in these, in these environments, but fascinating stuff. It's all growing too fast and I'm getting too old and too slow. And my memory is, is getting worse and worse as the days go by. And, and, you know, I just can't keep it all inside. Like obviously you can. Well, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a leaky sieve as well. Well, I was going to say to your two gaming point, Twitch has saved me so much money in games. I cannot believe begin to tell you. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I like, I like that game. I think I want to buy it. Nope. I just go on there and watch nope. other people like crash and burn through it. I'm like, all right, get all the fun. None of the, none of the costs along with it, but you know, I, you know, RT, you know, ray tracing to that point, I think, you know, you know, maybe it's not to my appreciable standards yet. Maybe I have too high of standards for it, but you know, when it comes, I think it'll be, uh, you know, when it becomes more ubiquitous, like you're saying that kind of, you know, old, newer games start to take that into consideration. I think that becomes the next big step, you know, like this is, yeah. this is where it starts to go and have some permanence and, you know, really so I'm all for realism. I think that that's a, that's a great thing. And um, yeah, look forward to the day. Cool. Well, we're pretty much at an hour. And so are there any closing comments, things you'd like to say or, or things that we have not covered that, that you would like to talk about? No, Josh, I mean, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. I mean, these things are great. It's always nice to meet members of the community that, you know, we all talk online all the time. So it's nice to put a face with the name and, you know, it is kind of nice. That. I'm, I'm sorry that I probably don't look as, as nice as I should, <laughs> but you know, it's, Oh, I get the comment no hair the all the time. Yeah, that's, I'm a, that's I'm a mountain big. man, evidently, or a lumberjack, or something like that. Yeah, you're probably um, even like a Patriots fan, aren't you? Well, I mean, there's uh, there's a little team that we beat the other day. What was that? What was what was the team again? Bengals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not a Bengals fan. No, oh, Jim, Jim and I are kind of uh, Bills fan now, so you better watch out in this this Saturday. Oh. yeah, we have you have you guys coming up, man. Yeah. Yes, Can't wait. Yes. See what see what happens. So yeah, I appreciate your Edelman beard going on there. <laughs> yeah. Now if I could just work on the physique, I think I would be ahead of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably would. Well, we really appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope to do more of these things in the future. And so you're 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 certainly part of the foundation that uh, we're trying to build here. And we really appreciate it. And maybe in six to eight months when new and interesting things happen and occur, we can we can certainly have you back and you can talk up what Dell is doing and some of your uh you know, kind of unique observations of the uh, of the non Dell world as as well as where technology is going. So, with that, we appreciate you guys coming as well. 
and you have a great day.